Okay, AP US History. This is the lecture intended for Friday, September 18th. Had some technological difficulties here at Sandusky High. The internet went down uh, just as I was starting to record and then I made my own mistake. So this is attempt number three. I suppose if the internet goes down, you may get stuck with a phone recording. Actually with an iPhone 11, it probably will look better than this. I just won't be able to do the share screen. But uh, we're gonna pick up at the Puritans are expanding. No, I don't want you to get confused, remember, Bailey's jumping around by region a little bit. He might bounce back a decade or two. So before we were kind of, we, we were definitely talking about the plantation colonies and particularly though Jamestown and Virginia. And then I think we got all the way up to the second Anglo-Powahatan War, 1644. Today we're gonna go back in time a little bit, still the same time period, the 1620s all the way through 37 and some other areas. But we're talking about New England. We're talking about how that's a little bit different. They, they were migrating to the United States and, and creating this new world for them as families. And they had different motives. They were there seeking religious, I'll say freedom for them. They don't necessarily want freedom for you and I, uh, their own to practice their own religious views. And I wanna start off with that point. I'm gonna bring a lot of books in uh, to supplement what you guys are learning. I'm not gonna make you read most of them. Uh, as a matter of fact, hardly any of them, just the few supplements like I gave you for the essay. But I will take stories out of books like this, One Night Stands with American History and, and other books that just have these little tidbits that really give you an idea of sort of the meat and potatoes of everyday life. And so this is an excerpt from this book about how serious people were in New England, particularly in Connecticut, uh, home base for many Puritans then, about their, uh, about their religious views, and about their commandments. So this is, uh, this is information about laws in the 1600s in the US, well, almost said a US colonies, not such a thing yet, uh, in the British colonies that would later become the United States, so in the 1600s. So I'm just gonna read these. If any child or children above 15 years of old and of sufficient understanding shall curse or smite their natural father or mother, he shall be put to death let me follow up with another one. If any man have a rebellious or stubborn son of sufficient age, vis-a-vis -vis 15 years of age, who will not obey the voice of his father, the voice of his mother, that when they have chastened to him, he shall, or he will not hearken to them, they, his natural parents, may lay hold upon him and bring him to the magistrates and testify that he will not obey their voice and chastisement, and this son shall be put to death. If you back talk to your parents, or dare, that is really bad, obviously, to hit your parents. Uh, it's not good to back talk either. But I mean, I've raised two, two children who are now in theory adults. Uh, from time to time, they might back talk, and then you do things like, you know, take their cell phone. In the 1600s in Connecticut, I don't know how often it was utilized, but you could put your child to death. So a little self-reflection, uh, if you're hard on mom and dad, uh, maybe be really thankful uh, that you don't live in Connecticut because apparently in the 1600s you could have been put to death for that. So having that as your backdrop about how serious these uh, these colonists and Puritans are about their religion, let's talk about some of the conflicts that they have. So as we had said, there are these conflicts as they're expanding west with Native Americans. And Native Americans eventually figure out their best hope for survival is a pan-Indian alliance. In other words, like a multi-nation alliance. Uh, Native American nations, which by the way today, like there's the Cherokee nation, okay? There, there's the, the nation of the Huron. The, each individual tribe, we as non-Native Americans often just lump together as Native Americans. They would want to be recognized by each individual tribe, uh, the Agala Sioux or wh whatever it might be. So, this is very common in North America to have at that time all these different Native American tribes. But Massasoit's son, Metacom, said, no, 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 we, we've got to ally, uh, have an alliance together to try to defeat these English. It's our only real hope because 75% of them had been wiped out already to that point by disease. And so let's set aside our issues and let's unify against the English. And so they have this pan-Indian alliance. And this pan-Indian alliance allows them to attack all along the frontier. Now I've shown you this map before, and we're gonna come back to this map several times. 
But I wanted to just give you the basic idea that when we say along the frontier, the frontier is always changing. So at this point in our lectures, really, oh, let's see if we can find a pen here. At this point in our lectures, you know, we're not really, New York doesn't really go all the way out to here. Maine doesn't really go all the way out to here. Massachusetts doesn't go all that far. You know, when you start off, you really have, did I use the same color pen? Am I really that dumb? Don't answer that. The frontier might be here. And so what you're gonna find out, and this really plays into Monday's lecture more, is then if you were an indentured servant, and again, I'll define that on Monday, but basically somebody who gave up seven years of their life, promised to be someone else's servant for seven years just to get to the new world. Once your seven years was up, or it could be more or less years, but most commonly seven years, you then were free, but you're, you probably left England as an indentured servant because you were broke. Now you've done your seven years as your payment to get here to the new world, and now you're in the new world and broke. Now, the reason you were willing to do that is there are more opportunities, more chances for you. But what's not always well advertised to the people back in England is that your chances are, oh, you can just move. If, if this is the, the frontier in 1637, you can move just to the edge of that frontier and you can just take land and create your own little homestead, your own little farm, cut down the trees and, and start on your own. But that free land that is out there, of course, belongs to Native Americans. So when Native Americans attack, they are going to attack along that frontier these more established communities, as time goes on, are gonna be, you know, the established community, you'll have to go through a lot of the frontier to get to these established communities. They're relatively safe. But if you're a family on this frontier, you're getting attacked. And that's who Medicom is attacking. He is using his forces to attack all up and down the frontier at that time, and just trying to absolutely torture and discourage any of the English from settling there. Now, Medicom is, used, is viewed as a, uh, let's say, a, a noble rival. Uh, not noble in that uh, they admire him as an equal, but at least see him as a fierce fighter. And so they do him the honor of giving him the name King Philip. That's a very English thing to do at the time, is to say, oh, well, we, we respect him enough to call him, and they just pick a name, King Philip. That's not his name. His name's Medicom. Um, now, Medicom ends up attacking all along the frontier and really causing a lot of chaos for these New England Puritan colonies. Eventually, they capture him. He still represents a threat, but I want you to have an idea of what they do to threats back then. Uh, so what they did was a very common English torture for people. When Medicom was caught, they, they sold his wife and child into slavery. That, that's not that common uh, in Europe, but this, this penalty is. He was drawn and quartered. And so if you don't know what drawing and quartering is, this is what they did. They put him on a table. If you've ever seen Braveheart, you've, you've got a, a good idea of how this works, he, where he's got his arms tied down and his legs are tied down, spread out for, you know, Four different directions here. And they've got his torso really tight and taut, stretched out. Okay. And they take this curved knife called a rapier and they stick it in your belly button. And they only puncture an inch, inch and a half, and then rip up. It is by design uh, not supposed to kill you, it is supposed to make you just. It, just go through extraordinary pain before they kill you. Now, that's the drawing part. So they've drawn you. They often, by the way, would then take out your bowels and light them on fire. Who thinks this stuff up? They would take out things. Now, side note, when, like, if you've ever had to have a surgery, they, they can take your stuff out, set it aside, and put it back in, which blows me away. Uh, but this is not their intent. They're taking this stuff out and lighting it on fire. So that's awful, but they're not done. They then quarter you. That means they take you down. You're not going to be running away now. And they tie a rope and a horse to this arm 
a rope and a horse to this arm, a rope and a horse to this arm, leg, and so on and so forth. And they get those four horses going in four different directions. And they say, giddy up. That's the quartering. You get split four ways. Then they take your head and chop your head off. What? Now, if they really, really respected you, they'd behead you. So you died a quicker, easier death, then draw and quarter you, just to make the point, I guess, for the crowd. Uh, but Medicom was drawn and quartered the more gruesome way. So this is what's going on with the threat of Native Americans as far as the Puritans are concerned. Now, this threat of Native Americans, and by the way, I keep looking over here because I am looking at my phone, but I'm looking at the timer to make sure, really, that I don't go too long. So, Native American threats are gonna continue even after Medicom is defeated. And so, what they decide to do was create this New England Confederation. You do what you do when you're threatened. You try to get with other people to protect yourself. So several of the colonies that had been created, remember we had that map last uh, yesterday, where we had all these different New England, oh, we have Connecticut, then we have New Haven, Connecticut, and we have all these different little Puritan chunks. Many of them unify together to defend against Native Americans. Now, in theory, why won't the English do this for them? Like the English government has sent them there because the English government is a mess. The English government is going through a crisis every 10 minutes in this era about whether or not they're going to be Protestant or Catholic. And then one group takes over and the other group feels threatened. And so there's just constant strife and civil turmoil going on in England. So they're really left to fend for themselves. So they create this New England Confederation, which is nice. It shows that there's some unity, except they leave out some of the colonies. They leave out Maine and they leave out Rhode Island. Well, why? because they're not uh, Puritan enough. The Puritans don't particularly care whether or not the non-Puritan or not Puritan enough colonies are protected. And so that's kind of, uh, kind of crooked, but that's where we were at that time. Now, turmoil continues in England and Charles II takes over. Again, that's English history, we don't need to know that, only in that it affects the colonies. When Charles II is restored, we call it the restoration, when he's restored to the throne in England, it is very well known that he is, if not Catholic friendly, Catholic. I mean, if, if not out and out Catholic, Catholic friendly. Which again, I place no judgment on this, but from the perspective of the Puritans, that's awful. Because if you're a Puritan, you're like, oh, we left because we thought that church in England was too, had too much Catholicism in it. Now we've got a king that is pretty much an open Catholic. Oh no. And so Massachusetts, Massachusetts Bay, what will eventually become Massachusetts, this area, which is almost, almost completely uh, habitated by Puritans, they pretty much start ignoring everything England says because by their very nature, because they're Puritans, they left. They're the separatists. They're the ones that left England. They're like, oh, I don't care what you guys say, which means that the English send all these orders all the time and they just ignore them. That's important to note, because even though this is 100 years before the revolution, there's a long standing history. It's no surprise that the revolution, the American Revolution, starts in Massachusetts, has so many major milestone moments that happen in Massachusetts. Being a Puritan is not really a big influence in 1776, but being used to ignoring English rules is. And so this is sort of where it comes back to. And so when the restoration occurs, and now we have, at least for a brief period of time, this ruler with real power who says, hey, we're not going to discriminate against Catholics. And the Puritans are like, ah, we don't want anything Catholic. He's going to impose some things upon them. And what he's going to do is he's going to say, among other things, let's see. Oh, no, where's the screen I want you to see? Nope, that's not it. Okay. All right, we got to get tricky here. Sorry, guys. This is what happens sometimes. Um, ladies and gentlemen, he, they are going to impose an outside ruler, not ruler, an outside influence on their colonies. They're going to send in this guy named Sir Edmund Andros. And Sir Edmund Andros is there 
to essentially be the king or, or the representative of the king's power in New England. And among other things, they say, we're going to create the dominion of New England to help bolster defenses against Native Americans. However, because the British government wants to protect all English colonies, they're going to invite all English, as a matter of fact, not invite, require all English colonies be protected by this dominion of New England. That really upsets the Puritans because they don't want to be lumped in with Rhode Island. They don't want to be lumped in with Maine. They feel that they are better than them. Uh, but Sir Edmund Andros says, no, 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 this is how it's going to be. I'm in charge now. I know you've been used to being in charge, but I'm in charge now. And we're going to protect all the English counties. And on top of that, we're going to enforce these things called navigation laws. Now, we're going to get back to these a little bit later. But basically, there were a series of laws that were designed to keep the English uh, colonies, to keep the English rich and the English colonies working for England. So in other words, it limited things like where you could buy goods from. If you had a choice and you could buy goods from France or England, the navigation law said you had to buy them from England. The whole purpose of the colonies is to enrich England. So even if you could get something cheaper from France, you can't buy it from France. You can't make certain things because they didn't want English colonies competing with manufacturing in England. Now, there wasn't much manufacturing going on, but the limited that there was. Now, those laws were largely ignored because England was such a mess, they couldn't enforce their own rules. But Andros says, no, no, no. We got our stuff together now. I'm here. Let's enforce these rules. And boy, does that make him super unpopular. Add to the fact that he goes to the Church of England openly, which in the eyes of the Puritans is far too Catholic. And oh my goodness, this is one of the most hated men in the New World. This guy then gets word that James II gets overthrown in the glorious revolution, uh, the bloodless revolution, by basically Protestant powers. Now, again, you don't need to know the English history. All you need to know is, oops, England flip-flopped again. Now they're Protestant. And now Andros knows, oh, bleep, I got to get out of town because I am no longer in authority and everybody hates me. And boy, is that a dangerous position to be in, somebody who was bossy and telling everybody what to do. And now this is a find out you don't have any authority. So he tries to dress like a woman to sneak out of the, of the colonies and get back home to England. And I believe the, the book says he was betrayed by his boots. Uh, and so they caught him and I believe mocked him. They might have tarred and feathered him, uh, but I'm not sure. And that then starts a time period of when they just, the colonies, Puritan colonies in particular, really just ignore the rules handed down by the English. And here's a real shocker for you. Essentially, from this point on, English rules to their English colonies are gonna be followed when it's convenient for the colonies until roughly the 1760s. That's a long time. And guess what's going to happen in the 1760s when they finally then start to, re to enforce these rules, which they haven't been enforcing? Oh, my goodness. They're going to lose their ever-loving minds because they're not used to it. I think the best way to explain this, and I like to, I like to use and compare what we call micro-history and macro-history or macro-concepts. Big picture. England controls the English colonies. English colonies don't really have to follow the rules for a long time. Then when English try to enforce the rules, it's been so long since they have that it doesn't go over very well. Micro. I'm going to give you a micro example of this, but you go, well, what's this silly example going to mean? I think you'd be surprised at how many times human behavior on the macro level can be understood by understanding it on the micro level. So for this little mental exercise, I'm going to adopt Sophia. Uh, Sophia, uh, Mrs. P and I are going to adopt you as our child. Sophia is 16, 17 years old. Boom, Sophia, you get adopted. Okay. Now, in this made-up world where somehow we've adopted you, you have to get used to these new rules. And like any parent, you know, I've, I've, raised, I've got a 22-year-old and an 18-year-old, and I'm sure looking back, we were stricter about some things than maybe your parents, and maybe we were looser about some things than your parents, because every parent is a little different. So Sophia's trying to feel her way through these new rules, and I say, hey, we're real strict around here about curfew, home by midnight. So the 
first weekend uh, she's under our roof, she comes home by midnight. Great. The next weekend, she comes home at 12.03. Nobody says anything. Okay, that went pretty well. Next weekend, she comes home at 12.15. Nobody says anything. Next weekend, she comes home at 1 a.m. Nobody says anything. This goes on for like a year. And by the end of the year, you're lucky if she's in before the sun comes up. She's rolling in at like 5, 5.30 a.m. or something like that. Nobody says a word. And then one Saturday night, Sophia comes home at like 12.05, like five minutes past curfew. But remember, for a year, she's been breaking curfew big time. And all of a sudden, for whatever reason, Mrs. P and I go, 12.05, you're grounded. That's outrageous. Sophia's going to lose her mind. Sophia's going to lose her mind because she's going to go, are you kidding me? Who do you think you are? For a year, I've been rolling in and out of here whenever I want. And now you're going to tell me 12.05 and go, hey, that's the rule. That ship has sailed. If, if I'm going to be strict about curfew, everybody in their head already knows when I have to be strict about it. I've got to be strict about it the very first time. I've got to be like, 12.03, you're grounded for three days. By the way, that was, that was our home rule. That'll get you looking at the clock. You're grounded a day for every minute late. And then we got one of those little uh, cameras, ring cameras, so we could like have the time marked. <laughs> awesome. But anyway, so back to Sophia. Sophia's going to lose her mind and argue that this is insane. And we're going to lose control of this. This is going to be this ugly, ugly fight. And I don't blame her because there hasn't been any consistency. That same angst. See, if, if she had come home that first week at 12 or 3, I ground her for three days, and then 12, and we reinforce 12, Coming home at 12.05 and getting in trouble for it would not be this big issue. She'd be accustomed to that. This is what's going on with the counties. We've been coming home at 5.30, if we come home at all, for 100 years. And then all of a sudden, in this case, you're going to send Sir Edmund Andrews, and now he's in charge. And then 100 years later, oh, you're going to make all these rules? And we're going to rebel. We're going to have this revolution. And that's literally what it's over. And from the perspective of, I'm looking for books, from the perspective of the Puritans, we just think that these people, <laughs> these people, uh, the people in England aren't as pure as we are. Uh, at least that's what the Puritans feel about Catholic rules. And I'm going to give you another example. I want to be very careful of this. I'm not judging this person at all. The Puritans clearly were. The English, when the restoration had occurred, would send over even governors and they would say, hey, this is the person in charge. That did not go over particularly well because they were perceived even though we're all English, or they're all English, as outsiders. So they send over this guy named Lord Cornberry. And Lord Cornberry uh, was sent over to believe, I think New York. Uh, yes. This is Lord Cornberry. And again, I want to be very clear. I am not shaming this man's behavior in any way, shape, or form. I am not going to gender shame or... Uh, shame how he wants to dress, et cetera. But he had a fondness for appearing in what would be traditionally considered women's clothes. I'm not going to shame him, but boy, how do you think this goes over in Puritan society? A society, I will remind you, that will execute children for back talk. How are they gonna to respond to outsiders who like to uh, dress in traditional female clothing and then get picked up on the streets of New York for suspicion of prostitution, which wasn't true. It was just that the governor was out late at night and that's the only reason they thought women would be out that late at night. Um, they just look at England and go, oh my gosh, you guys are a mess. We're not, we're not messing with you. Uh, we, we're better than you, we're gonna do our own thing. And that's important to understand then that sort of Puritan perspective. Again, not saying it's right or wrong, I'm saying they do not see the world the same way. So that's sort of setting the stage of what's going on in the English colonies. Meanwhile, there's going to be some competition from some other nations. And so we are going to have competition from, well, not Sir Edmund Andros, but if I share the screen, maybe I can go to the other one. We are going to have competition from the Netherlands. No, I literally Googled, where are the Netherlands? I promise, I know where the Netherlands are. However, I want you to know where the Netherlands are. And they are in Northwest Europe, right here. Now, Google this sometime you want to go down a rabbit hole. Why are they called the Dutch? But that's a whole other thing. The New, uh, Netherlands had worked with the English 
to fight the Spanish for the Dutch independence. And once they got their independence, they then established their own, boy, I hope you're seeing all these screen changes. I think you are. If not, you'll, you'll be able to imagine it. They then establish what they call the New Netherlands. Boy, that is hard to see there, and that is actually not a great map of that at all. That's an overly ambitious map. This is a little bit more accurate. And if you don't recognize that, that is essentially lower New York, including Manhattan Island. That's where they established their little mini kingdom. And the English aren't crazy about this because the English government is like, we just helped you revolt against the Spanish. And now using uh, an English explorer, Henry Hudson, because uh, some of these explorers were just sort of hired guns, they create this new Netherlands. And it's kind of right where the English are looking to expand. And so there's an absolute inevitable conflict. But the Dutch end up becoming important because they leave a lot of namesakes in this area. They do establish some things that you are familiar with. So for example, uh, they are attacked by Native Americans on several, several occasions. So they build Wall Street. Uh, and when you think of Wall Street in New York, you know, you think of that financial center. I mean, I don't mean to make make you feel silly, but if you ever thought about the name, I mean, Wall Street is named Wall Street because there used to be a wall all along that street. Why was there a wall? Because Native Americans attacked all the time. Now let's go to why they attacked all the time. Native Americans were attacking the Dutch in particular because the Dutch treated Native Americans horribly and because they felt they'd been robbed in an interaction, a trade, a trade that is rather infamous. You see, the Dutch, when on Manhattan Island, which is New York, you think of New York City, this, we're talking about Manhattan, some of the most valuable real estate in the world. But to have whatever house you or I might have here in Ohio on Manhattan Island, you could just start at a million and go up from there and it's probably way more than that. So we're talking about very valuable real estate. You'll hear the story that the Dutch bought this for like 22 or $24 worth of trinkets. And people use this as some sort of way to make fun of Native Americans go, look, they didn't even know what they had, et cetera. Okay, let's just stop this misnomer right now and right here. One, Native Americans did not have a, a concept of land ownership. Native Americans believed if you couldn't put it in your pocket, you couldn't own it. In other words, you couldn't take it with you anyway. You couldn't own it. Even generations later, famous Native American Tecumseh said, sell the land, impossible. Uh, why not sell, sorry, old guy, I gotta take off the glasses. Why not sell the air, the clouds, and the sea? Did not great, the great spirit make, him for all, make this for all of his children? You can't sell land because you can't possibly take it with you. It outlives you. That's sort of the Native American perspective. So that's problem number one with them selling it for $24. Interesting thing about this quote, by the way, we also sell water. I mean, we sell it on a large scale because cities provide it and clean it. And, bring it to your tap, not to mention bottled water, but that's okay. We'll, we'll make Tecumseh roll over in his grave at a future time. Um, the next thing is, is that the Native Americans that they encountered in Manhattan were simply there hunting, because at that time, Manhattan was considered usable for hunting by several tribes without anybody wanting to fight over it. So the only way I can make you understand this again is to go that micro macro level. I want you to imagine that um, Tiernan uh, comes to Sadusky High School. He drives to the front circle. He's got to pick up something for school. He's got to pay a fee or whatever he's got to do. He happens to be out front there, and he's getting ready. He goes in, come out, comes out, and there's a limo parked out front of Sadusky High School. And there's some rich guy there, and he says, hey, uh, you here. What's your name? Tiernan? Okay. Tiernan, I'd, like I'd like to buy this building from you for... Mm, $10,000. Now, on the one hand, what a ridiculous notion. Sandusky High School sits on real estate that's worth, I would think, way more valuable than that, not to mention the building and the contents, and it's worth millions and millions and millions of dollars if somebody just wanted to buy it to have. It's not for sale also, but most importantly, Tiernan doesn't own it. Uh, it's owned by the city of Sandusky. But wouldn't he say yes? If I'm him and some rich guy says, hey, I'll give you 10,000 for this right now, cash. Would you sell something that's not yours to sell? 
and take the money and laugh all the way and go, well, what a dummy. What did this guy just buy? What, you think I get sell in high school? That's what we think the Native Americans thought. Like, oh, you want to give us this giant box of trinkets worth $24 to buy the land? <laughs> sure. It's not ours. We're just hunting here. You can't buy land anyway from the perspective of Native Americans. And that's how this big land sale goes down that is so often mocked by other people. It's impossible. It, it's a thing that just can't happen in their minds. Now, one last conflict and then we'll be done. We're going to be done a little early today because different days we expect more out of you than other days and you're going to have a lot of reading tonight um, or at least this weekend. But at the same time, uh, the Swedish, uh, the Swedes try to create their own little, and they do briefly have their own little colonies and the Dutch immediately recognize them as a threat and attack them. And you're going to find out on Monday that the English are going to attack the Dutch. And so there's going to be a, a lot of land transfers real quick. Of course, who loses is Native Americans, uh, but also the Dutch and the Swedes are going to be kicked out of the quote unquote new world, at least the English new world. And you're going to really only be left with a lot of names. Uh, and you wonder, well, why, why is this name that? Or, you know, where do these names come from? They're Swedish or Dutch in, in heritage, and they've just stuck around. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that gets us through all the material we needed to get through today. There are a lot of, there's a lot of reading to do today, including those supplements about Hannah Dunson uh, and indentured servitude, because we're gonna get to talk about those. So reading those, I, I might make the Hannah Dunson story fair game for a pop quiz. Hello, when's the next time I'm gonna see you? It's gonna be Tuesday. I'm gonna see you today. I wouldn't give you a pop quiz on Friday's reading on Friday. Uh, so I guess I could give you a pop quiz on Tuesday on that. So I really want you to read that Hannah story. I want you to memorize every single detail of it because when you retell it for your essay, you're going to give me a brief version of it, but I want you to have the basics of it. Sort of like if you were telling a friend or family member about what happened to Hannah, what, what was the story, and you're going to be able to recap the highlights. Um, so there's a lot of reading to do, so I'll let you cut out of here early. Hope everybody's doing great. Oh, I attached the Friday Fun Day video. Don't have to watch it if you want to laugh. Uh, I'm trying to film them in different places uh, or doing different things. I'm in a boat in three to four foot waves when I film this one. Everybody have a great weekend. See ya.